What's up, Real Life family? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We're excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life, and we believe that day could be today. We would love it if you would share this experience. Click the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here in Claremont. Always some love to our campuses and everyone joining us online. We love you guys. And uh, we're in our Bold in Babylon series. It's a study on the book of Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter three again. There's so much in Daniel chapter three, I could have preached a series on just Daniel chapter three. But last week, uh, our guys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they took a stand and this week they're in the fire. And uh, how many of you already know following Jesus is a wild ride? Yep, it's a wild ride, man. People are like, so what's it going to be like? No idea. Well, I mean, you've been doing it a while, so yeah, but yours might be different than mine. It is a, the, the Christian life is highly unpredictable. And you'd like to think that, okay, my life was crazy before. Now I give my life to Jesus. Now it's up and to the right. It's peaceful. It's problem free. It's progressive. And it just isn't the way it works out. I was looking recently, we've had, I think it's a little over 370 baptisms so far this year in 2023. Super exciting. Over 370 baptisms I'm celebrating with you. That means we have a lot of newer, younger Christians, people just getting started in their faith. And some of you, I've already heard it, you're like, hey, um, so I gave my life to Jesus and now I'm getting my tail kicked. What's up with that? I'm like, yeah, that's kind of how it works because remember, the front of the shirt, God's crazy about you. The back of the shirt, and the enemy's after you. That's the fine print. It's actually like, it's small print under, you have to lift a shirt. God's crazy about you. The enemy's after you, and it won't be easy. That's the thing. And I think sometimes we think it's going to be easy, and when we find out it isn't, that's when things change. Um, Daniel chapter three, I was thinking about this chapter in a, a couple weeks ago for my wife's birthday. I took her away for a long weekend, and we went with some other couples, and so it was like a couple's trip. You know, that's different. Like, actually, when Robin and I go away, for whatever reason, we like to push ourselves. It's like, how many steps can we get in a day? How much hiking can we do? We want physical activity. For her, it's how many chores can we do? It's like, we might be at somebody else's rental place and we're fixing it up for them. So like, we wanna do chores, we wanna get stuff done. So we're on a couple's trip and we kind of pushed everybody a little bit past the comfort zone. And so there was like this collective, hey, let's do something restful tomorrow. So that was the plan. Like we're just gonna, and it's vacation, so we're gonna do something peaceful and relaxing. And so I came up with an idea because we were up in the North Georgia mountains, like why don't we go down the river? Why don't we float? Everybody talks about floating down the river and they get in their tubes and like, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have the, is there anything more restful sounding in the world than floating down a river? I'm like, that's what we're gonna do tomorrow. Bring a cooler and sunscreen. We are floating down the river. Well, turns out, Minor surgery would have been more relaxing than the river trip. It was more like deliverance than the lazy river, okay? Like we were going down this thing and it was wild. And the guys, we had decided to uh, go on paddle boards. So we're on paddle boards, but you have to take the fin off because there's rocks. So we're on finless paddle boards, just kind of going wherever. And the guys were falling off and banging their knees. But to be safe, we put the ladies in tubes because what could be safer than a tube? Well, unless you're going down a waterfall backwards, banging your head on the rocks. And then here's the other thing about the tube. It has a hole in the middle. And so some of the rocks come up and hit you in the wrong place. <laughs> Two of the ladies, wah, they're coming out. They're like, oh, just got hit in a rock. And, you know, and, and so Robin's like, She's like, I, that's not happening to me. I watched this woman reverse plank for three hours. She had, I, she was so sore when we got finished. It was not relaxing. Next time I think we're gonna chop down trees for our easy activity. But 
You know, sometimes you think it's going to be easy. It turns out it's not as easy as you thought. And I'm thinking about, I think one of the popular myths about the Christian life is that it's easy. You know, C.S. Lewis said something. He had this great quote. He's the guy that wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He was a great philosopher, an amazing Christian. And he writes the Chronicles of Narnia, and he's describing Jesus in the form of his character, Aslan, right? And, and so somebody asks, is he safe? Is he safe? And, and, and the character answers, oh, no, of course he's not safe. He's good, and he's the king, but he's not safe. And I think that's true when we're following Jesus um, he's good and he's king, but this ride is wild and it's not going to be easy. And, you know, growing up, I remember uh, one of the things I, I, I heard this message and it stuck with me. And then it became one of those kind of Christian cliches. Growing up as a Christian in the 80s and 90s, you, you'd have these certain phrases that, you know, they'd show up on your coffee mug, on your calendar, on your T-shirt. And um, I remember hearing this, that the, the safest place to be is the center of God's will. The safest place, the surest thing in your life, the safest place to be is the center of God's will. And I heard that, pre I'm like, that's perfect. So all I have to do is just be good and, and just do what God says and nothing bad will happen to me. That wasn't true. And in fact, it's not what Jesus promised. If you, if you actually look, what he said is, in this world you will have trouble. That's what he promised. If you wanna live a godly life in me, you will be persecuted. The world hated me. They're gonna, they will hate you. That's what he said. And that's exactly what we see in Daniel chapter three. Um, and, and we saw it last week in this story. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they take their stand and now they're in the fire. And so is he safe? No, but he's good. But here's the story. Daniel three, starting in verse 15. Now this is Nebuchadnezzar. These guys are in front of the, the, the highest ranking leader in the known world right? The ruler of pretty much everything. And he says, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, uh, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if now, because they haven't so far bowed down and they're in trouble, but if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then what God is going to be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into this blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to then go and tie up Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and throw them in to the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes and trousers and turbans and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took them up there. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Okay, so they take their stand. They follow God. They show their faith. And now they're in the fire. I don't like the story. <laughs> I mean, like... I would write it differently. And in fact, I think what I would expect is, okay, I did the God thing. I did the faith thing. I showed courage and strength. And so therefore, it ends well. Like, therefore, my problem goes away. I think most people, uh, I don't know what I was expecting, God, but I was kind of expecting maybe the king would be like, well, look at you guys. I need more people like you. You know what? Instead of the fiery furnace, how about a long weekend in Cancun? Show them what they've won. Vacation beats incineration any day, right? Sure, thank you so much. We did the right thing, God bless. I, we have this mentality though, I did the right thing, I followed God, I showed my faith, shouldn't I get blessed now? Isn't now the time when I get rewarded? And that's what you'd expect. That, in fact, that's what they expected. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what'd they say? They said, actually, our God is able to deliver us and he will deliver us. That's what they said. So they went out on faith, they went out on a limb, they're expecting this miracle, and now they're in the furnace. There's a key phrase in here 
that's part of their testimony, that demonstrates their faith, that I think is a big piece of what's missing in our faith today. Daniel 3, verse 18, it says this, but even if he does not, we believe he will, we believe he's able, we, we know that he will, but even if he does not, we're not changing. It, that's a powerful statement. Even if he does not. We believe he can. We believe he will, even if he does not. What do you do when God doesn't do what you thought he would do? There's a question for your faith, right? What do you do when God doesn't do what you wanted him to do? What you expected him to do? What you maybe even asked him to do? That's something we got to figure out as modern day Christians because I would say this, I think faith is a big part of the experience for us today, but I think most people that I see and encounter and hear on TV, that we mostly have faith and it's about believing God for things. Have you noticed this? Well, I'm just trusting God, I'm just believing God for this and I'm believing God for that and I'm believing God's gonna do this and, and he's gonna bless this and protect that and watch over that and I'm believing for this. It's faith, yeah, but in a desired outcome. It's faith, but in an expected result. It's faith that God will do what I want him to do. I mean, anybody else ever rub the Bible and like hope that the genie would come out? And like, Lord, I'm just, woo, dingle, dingle, ding, dingle, 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 ding. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And what I, what I sometimes realize is, okay, okay, he's not a genie granting my wishes. He's a father answering my prayers, but that's different. And there's tension here. I have faith, but what is it in? And I have faith that God will do what I want him to do, but what if he doesn't? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they say that we believe that God is able, that he's willing, that he's going to come through, but even if he does not, we're still with him. I believe that God is looking for some people today that have the faith that says even if he doesn't. He's looking for some, even if he doesn't, faith people. You know, people whose faith isn't in the outcome, but in the one who controls all outcomes. People whose faith isn't in the provision, but it's in their provider. People whose faith isn't in how it's all gonna work out, but in the one who holds all things together and works all things together for their good. That's the kind of faith we need. That even if he doesn't faith, you know, I want you to know today that God is able. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're wearing, he's able for sure. Ephesians 3.20, he, he's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine according to his power. He's able for sure. And we need to believe that, that with God, all things are possible. I need that faith. I need to never let go of that faith. But I also need the kind of faith that says, even if he doesn't, I'm still with him. I'm still for him. I'm still standing in him and standing on the rock that is him. You know, in John chapter six, Jesus's ministry took a shift and it went from uh, handing out free bread to speaking some hard truth and people started leaving. And that happens sometimes. And so the people were taken off in John six and, and Jesus confronts his disciples. He, he's like, I guess you guys are probably going to at some point, right? And in, in verse 68, Peter replied, he's like, where else are we gonna go, Jesus? To whom else would we go? You alone, you have the words of eternal life. Is he safe? No, but he's good. He's king. Does he always do what we expect him to do? Absolutely not, but he's still Jesus. Does, does he sometimes miss an expectation that, yeah, for sure, but he's still king. He's still God. And he can, I believe he will, but even if he doesn't, it, it, Think about your life right now. The things that you're praying for, you're hoping for, you're asking God for, maybe really, truly believing God for. Uh, I think most of us in here know what it's like to really need God to come through for you. And maybe you're in that season, but the things right now, we know what it's like to need God to come through for us. And some of you are holding out that hope and you're hanging on to that faith and believing God's gonna do that thing. But what if he doesn't? Then what? You know, what if I believed God was gonna keep me from the fire and now here I am in the furnace anyway? You know, I, I may have the kind of faith that believes God will, but do I have the kind of faith to believe him even if he doesn't? That's a different level of faith. That's a deeper level of faith. 
I'll tell you my testimony. Personally, I have had my faith shattered more than once. Like, oh shoot, that's the pastor. I put my faith, I believed God was going to do certain things that he ended up not doing. At major moments in my life, I believed God was going to not let certain things happen to me that ended up happening. And in some cases, they were harder than I had already feared. All right, let's pray. That was encouraging. Thank you, Lord, for your dinner. That's just true. But as I look back on those things, you know, as you grow older in faith and you've been walking with God, you look back and you go, oh, you didn't do my thing because you were busy doing your thing. Thank you, Lord. You didn't fulfill my plan because you were busy working out your plans and they were better. You, other things, we're still in process. And I'm, I'm going, hey, are you, you're going to do that again, right? Remember how you, because right now it doesn't look good. I'm just waiting. But, but either way, you know, where I'm at is even if he doesn't, I, I guess I'm at that place in life. I've shared it with you before. I'm at this place in life and in my faith where if, if God never did another thing for me, I'd still owe him the rest of my life for what he's already done. And, and I think so many people are coming to God with expectation and entitlement and demands. And I need to, you need to prove this and you need to do this. And I want to see this. And the truth is, if God never did another thing for me, what he did on the cross is already too much. If someone was only going to do one thing for you and that was the one thing, it's enough. The cross is enough. Jesus is enough. Salvation is enough. Forgiveness of sins is enough. Eternal life in heaven is enough. He doesn't owe me anything. And I still owe him everything for what he's already done. So I'm putting my faith in him, not because of what I think he's going to do. I'm putting my faith in him, even if he doesn't. I'm not putting my faith in the what. I'm putting my faith in the who. My faith isn't in what, what might happen, but it's in the one who holds all things together and makes them happen. That's real faith. Real faith is when I put my faith in the who, not the what. As Christians, here's something encouraging. You'll like this one. As believers, victory is already assured. We win. Did you know that? If you're in a game, you already know you're... You, we have guaranteed results that we will win this battle. We will be victorious. And so th this is already known. We know we win. We just don't know when. You, you don't know when, but you know you win. That's a beautiful thing. And that's what we need faith for. Faith is, is the thing that's going to keep me in that gap between now and then. Faith, what does 1 Corinthians 13 say? Paul says, abide. Now these three things are here. Abide, faith, hope, and love. We still have faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Why? Because it's the only eternal one of those. Did you know faith wasn't eternal? Why did, wait, faith isn't eternal? I won't need faith when I'm hanging out with Jesus. I won't need faith when I'm holding his hand. I won't need faith when he's wiping every tear from my eye. I won't need faith when he's hugging me and, and holding me with those nail-scarred hands. I'll know and I'll be in his presence. Faith is until then. Faith is for the in-between. Faith is what gets me through until that victory is here. Faith is for the, man, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how long this is going to take. Faith is for the, this may end badly. Faith is for the, I think he's going to, but even if he doesn't, that's the kind of faith we need. And, and here's what I found about Jesus is when I finally get to that level of faith, which I don't always, but when I do, when, when my faith gets to that place where I say, even if he doesn't, that's usually when he does. Anybody else notice that? God's got some quirks. I'm just telling you, God, when my faith gets to the place where I say, even if he doesn't, that's usually when he does. And here's what we find out. I got to read you the rest of the story. Verse 23, just review. The king's command was so urgent that the furnace was so hot, the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. It's kind of over, except then king, king Nebuchadnezzar, he leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? Certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. My, my, my. 
Jesus hadn't even been born yet and he's hanging out with them. He was there. He was with God in the beginning. He was God in the beginning. That fourth man in the fire. We sang that song today, man. I don't, let this boost your faith. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, royal advisors, all the ones that ratted them out, crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. The robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. That's crazy. You ever been next to a smoker outside? You smell like it for six days. These guys were in the furnace, no smell. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted them and sent them on a paid vacation. I added that last part. Wow, when God does his thing, you know, God's will is, is always amazing. And, and here's a, just two simple principles I found for me to get God's will. God's will comes from doing things God's way, but it also comes from waiting on God's when. I'm doing things God's way and I'm waiting on God's when. And this story is so wild, not just because of what God does, but because of when he does it. The miracle happens, but let's be honest, it's a little late. God shows up and when God shows up, he always shows off. But I'm kind of like, hey, where were you five minutes ago? I, I would have loved to meet you before this. He, he waits till they're actually in the furnace. We get God's will by doing things God's way, waiting on God's win. Here's what we know. His ways are not our ways. He told us that, right? If you've been walking with him, you know he wasn't lying. His ways are not our ways and his time is not our time. With the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. Peter tells us that in Galatians 6, 9, the promises will reap the harvest. We'll see the miracle if we do not give up. He says at the proper time. God, when? When are you going to come at the right time? When is that? You'll see if you don't give up at the proper time. If you don't give up with God, it's all about timing. And I believe some of us miss our miracle. Not because we don't trust, but because we don't trust long enough. Not because we don't have faith, but because we don't keep having faith. And we miss the miracle because we bail on God too early. Camping World Stadium, September 2016. College football extravaganza. It's FSU versus Ole Miss. All right? I can't say I'm the biggest college football fan in the world. My cousin is a professor at FSU, so it's a family obligation, right? I'm doing some kind of tomahawk situation now. And so uh, I'm there and, and someone gives me tickets to this game. And I'm like, okay, I find out the game is 100% sold out, 65,000 people in attendance, completely packed. My friend gives me these free tickets and they're in a good section. I'm like, this is gonna be cool. This is gonna be a good game, Camping World Stadium. And I, and I grab one of my friends, I go to the game. And what I didn't know until I got there was the person who gave me the tickets is like a high-ranking alumni of Ole Miss. So who am I sitting next to? The running back's mom. I am in like a sea of, of Mississippi people. Uh, and, and I'm just not fitting in. Like these, these are like the, the players, moms and dads and cousins and families and cheerleader relatives and the friends of the band. And they are just die hard, the most heavily invested Ole Miss people in the world. I'm right in the middle of them and I don't belong there. And it becomes obvious at some point, I'm not from Mississippi. I don't know how they can tell, but they could tell. And, and somebody finally asked me, where are you from? And I was like, Florida. <laughs> and the whole thing was like a record scratch. It was like, ah, he's the enemy. This big guy's like, oh, and it's like, they couldn't wait that every time they scored, eat it, Florida man. You know, like, ah, oh, okay. I'm really not even that into it. Um, it 
Listen, this was like one of the worst games ever to be from Florida because all these, Mississippi was crushing us. So it, it actually, like every play, every call went in their favor for the whole first half. I'm just sitting there and I'm just taking one for the team. It got so embarrassing. I think the score at halftime was like 28 to three. It was so embarrassing. I'm like looking for houses in Mississippi. I'm like, I can't live here. This is bad. They were destroying us. And so halftime comes, you know, you go to the restroom and I realized, I told my friend, I'm like, let's just go because I'm, I'm you know, I'm getting verbally abused out here. This is not this is not entertainment. And he's like, yeah, it's a terrible game. 28 to three, like who wants? So, so we leave, we go, you know, we're walking out to the car. All of a sudden the stadium is like thunder. It's like, Whoa! like what happened? And we're asking people and they're like, oh, FSU just scored. I'm like, of course they did, you know, of course they did. So then, then we get in the car, I get an update notification on my phone, FSU scored again. I'm like, okay, that's plus 14, plus 14. I'm like, that's getting close. That's that's, that's a game, you know? I get home, because I left at halftime. I'm like, what is, it was 28 to three. And, and now I get home and I realize, I check, the, I check the box and FSU's up by one point, it's 29, 28. And so I turn on the game. The game I was just physically at and had really good seats to, I'm now watching on TV. And what I witnessed was one of the greatest comebacks in FSU history. And they ended up winning this game 45 to 34 and they crushed Old Miss. And not only did I miss the ending of the game, but I missed the chance to gloat over my enemies. <laughs> ah, Gator, all of it. In your M-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -I. I'll never, I've been practicing for six years. I just want to meet someone from Mississippi. You know, I think I, I missed it. I missed it. I bailed early and I missed it. And my cousin will never forgive me for that. But I think some of us, some of us, we miss our miracle because we bail on God too early. We, we miss the miracle because, not that we don't trust, that we don't trust long enough. It's not that we don't have faith, we don't hold on to our faith long enough. To get the miracle, you have to play it all the way through till the very end. Galatians 6, 9, at the proper time. It's gonna happen when it's supposed to happen. If, what, if you do not give up, that's when you reap the harvest. And so where's God? What's he doing? Why isn't he doing this? What, he, well, he's waiting for just the right moment to do just the right thing because that's what God does. And that's where God is. So many of us miss the miracle because we bail too soon. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 24, the one who stands firm until the end, to the end, not, not just a little while, don't hang in there for a long time, but all the way, you gotta make it all the way to the credits to see what God's doing. You gotta finish that movie, it's like a Marvel movie. You finish the movie, you wait for the credits, and then there's another movie after the movie. You gotta hang on, it's not the 11th hour, people, oh, God comes in the 11th hour, no. It's 11 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, and 59 milliseconds, and then sometimes he's an hour late. I waited all the way to the end, why? Because with God, it's not over even after it's over. With God, too far gone, nothing's too far gone for God. Whatever it is, wherever it is, however bad it is, he can redeem it, he can revive it, he can resurrect it. Isn't that the thing that he does that no one else can do? Like, guys, our faith is in, it's based on a miracle that required God to wait too long. Think about that. Our faith, our whole faith, we're Christians because we believe in a miracle that required death. There's no empty tomb without an occupied grave. God had to wait until it was way too late because with God, it's not over even after it's over. So we don't give up on God because he never gives out on us. You gotta trust him all the way to the end. Matthew 10, 22, you'll be hated by everyone because of me. This is Jesus. You're gonna have to take that stand. They're gonna throw you into the furnace, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You gotta ride that wave all the way to your fins stick in the sand. That's the way I taught my boys when they were surfing, when they were little, like, when do I get off? You just ride it all the way to the beach. You keep going, and after you've kept going, you stay on a little bit longer, because God's not through yet. He says, I need you to trust me to the very end. 
And then, you know what? There's a cool promise at the end of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 20. And he says, here, here it is. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end. We trust him to the end because he's with us to the very end. And what we see in Daniel 3 is basically that promise fulfilled hundreds of years before it's ever made. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stand their ground, they face the fire, but Jesus is with them in the furnace. And, and you know what, what we're going through? All of us go through different things, but they're all kind of similar. Life is hard. God is good, but life is hard. And so the things we face require faith. It's not in what is seen, it's what is unseen. And I've got to trust the only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. It's going to require faith. If it's not a faith, it's sin. It's not even really, it's going to require me, right? What we face requires faith. But here's what happens. Our faith proves he's faithful every time. Those who put their hope in the Lord will not be put to shame. He who promised is faithful. Our faith always proves his faithfulness. And his, his faithfulness is proved through our faith. We show him our faith. He shows us that he's faithful. And for me, the greatest part of this miracle in, in Daniel chapter three is, is not just that, you know, they, they win and then their enemies have to kind of, oh man, and then, you know, and even some of them are destroyed. I really do like that part, by the way. Uh, pray for me. But to me, the greatest part of the miracle is, is not how God, I guess, turns things around. It's not, it, it, well, he didn't prevent the problem, did he? He didn't prevent the problem. But the miracle to me was that he was present in the problem. He didn't prevent the pain necessarily, but he was present right there in the middle of the pain. He, he didn't cause them to avoid the fire, but he was with them in the fire, turned up seven times hotter than it had ever been. The heat was on and the consequences were high and Jesus was with, I think our greatest miracle is, is often found in the fact, not that God removes the problem, but that he reveals his presence in the problem. He says, I will, I'm with you always, always. That's one to underline. Where's God? He's with you. Well, but I don't, he's with you. I don't see him. He's with you. Always. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Never. Always. I'm there. I'm there. And, and what I found about Jesus, and I could testify this, he's never nearer than when you need him the most. He shows up. You ask him and he's there. And even though you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear the evil. Why? Because he, he says, you're with me. It's his presence that's greater than any problem. The miracle isn't that he prevents the pain, but that he's present in the pain. Our God is an ever-present help in time of need. Psalm 46, one. Our promise, you know, we've been promised a lot of things by God. And I think a lot of Christians haven't flipped through the Bible and gone, wait, he promised that, wait, that. I, claim those promises, get in the word, find out what he said to you. As you'll do that, it'll boost your faith and you'll see all these promises God has for you. But there is a promise in there that you will have problems. One of the promises that Jesus gave us in this world, you will have trouble. They hated me, they're gonna hate you. If you're trying to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. He, he, he's promised not the absence of problems, but he's promised his presence. The promise isn't that he's gonna remove my problems, but that at some point he will reveal his presence. And that's the miracle. And today, I believe that God is inviting us to trust him. Not just with a faith that says, I believe you will, but a faith that says, even if you don't, even if you don't, you, you, you don't have to do another thing for me, I'm still with you. Even if you don't, I still will, and I still do. I'm not giving up on you because I know you'll never let go of me. I'm not bowing down, I'm not backing down, I'm not caving in, I'm not bailing out because my faith isn't in the what. It's in the who, it's in the one. Today, God's inviting us to put our faith in him, to keep our faith in him. No matter what it looks like or feels like, how hot the heat is getting, how much it's been turned up, how, how long it seems like it's taking, my faith is in him and I know he's with me. He, he may not do the thing I asked him to do, but he's with me. He may not meet the deadline that I gave him, but he's with me. And he'll be there when I need him the most. Thank you, Lord.
And what, what I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego show me is that when you stand up for God, he shows up for you. He's coming through. Some of you are trusting, keep trusting. Some of you are waiting, keep waiting. Some of you are wondering when, at the proper time, don't give up. You may feel like it's too late, it's never too late for God. The question isn't, will he come through? The question is, will you trust him all the way until he does? Let me pray for us. God, thank you today. Your word, uh, it's always so relevant. There's so much that we go through, that we deal with, and then there you are, right in the midst of it. And just today, this uh, I, it couldn't be more perfect and personal as I look at this for each one of us. And even yet, you know, there's, there's a, an aspect of this. I, I can't really relate to what they were going through. I got the figurative furnace, but I don't have the real one. But I thank you for three young men that you had walked with long enough and, and personally enough that they knew, they knew you were coming through. I thank you that by being there for them time and time again, that they knew you were coming through for them, but they also knew that even if you didn't, you were right, you were God and they weren't going anywhere. Would you give us that kind of faith, God? As we realize, you know what, you're not safe. It's gonna be a wild ride. You're not safe, but you're good and you're king. Where else are we gonna go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We're sticking with you, Jesus. And we're not bowing to them. We're not backing out and bailing out and caving in. We're going forward because we know that you're crazy about us. You proved that when you went to the cross for us. And, and if you never did another thing for us, Lord, you did it and it's enough and thank you. You went to the cross for us and you're coming back for us. And so we're here and we're waiting and we're trusting and we're hoping and we're believing and we can't wait to see what you're gonna do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this video encouraged you. As part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer or would like to get connected to any of the resources we mentioned, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find links to our website and other Real Life resources available for you in the description area below. Thanks so much for spending part of your day with us. We want you to know that God loves you, we love you, and we'll see you next time.